thanks so much for, for inviting me to be here. Very, uh, uh, very keen to give you guys this talk. So introduction, um, first things first, who am I? Um, so my name's Alex Dean. Uh, I'm one of the two co-founders of Snowplow Analytics. We're the company behind Snowplow, the open source event data pipeline. Um, so our mission at Snowplow is to help companies make better decisions. Um, at various parts of my career, both kind of at Snowplow and before Snowplow, I've been a data engineer, I've been a business analyst. Um, I've never been a data scientist, so um, uh, I, I, I take direction from all of you guys on, on, on the, uh, the art and science of data science. Um, at the weekend, I am trying to finish a book for Manning called Event Streams in Action. Um, so that kind of, uh, that's a little bit about me. So in, in terms of that kind of classic wheel of, of data science, um, I've got, I think I've got a fair bit of domain expertise, a uh, fair bit of knowledge about computer science, but, but the mathematics, uh, alas, is beyond me, so just being honest. Um, what is Snowplow? Snowplow is a real-time event data pipeline designed for the data team. Um, so my co-founder, Yali, and I, we created Snowplow so that companies could own their own customer event data uh, without having to uh, hire a bunch of data engineers and build all this stuff from scratch. So funny story, when we started Snowplow, um, we thought we'd spend about six months doing that plumbing, building that pipeline, open sourcing it. And then with that kind of grimy work done, we'd, uh, we'd get back to data analytics and, and creating insights for businesses. Seven years later, 2019, <laughs> we're still building um, data pipelines, still building event data pipelines. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a big old job. Um, so we have uh, about 150 customers and a, a really large open source community, um, including uh, some, some, some people, some companies in this, in this room, which is awesome. Um, and we've always been about um, the data team, even before the data team really existed or was called the data team. Um, so by data team, we mean um, probably some sort of head of data, um, some sort of lead data person, um, and then data scientists, data engineers, and then typically business analysts who are helping kind of um, translate and map that, that team's work to, to the wider business. Um, so that's, that's kind of us, that's some important context. Um, so officially my talk is about why high quality data is crucial for your machine learning models. Um, this is a very important topic, I will make sure to cover it, um, but actually I want to I go wider, I want to take a wider remit today. Um, I can't tell you how to do data science, you can tell me how to do that in the next coffee break, but what I hope I can tell you, um, based on my experience at Snowplow, is what makes an effective data team. And of course, data scientists are a really important part of that, that data team. Um, and my focus will be on the data team inside companies, because that's, that's kind of what I know, know best. Um, so a bit of framing, first of all, because this is quite important. So how do we um, at Snowplow think about the software landscape? Um, the data space is incredibly hectic, chaotic, confused. There's a lot of different players in it. The way we think of it is there's kind of these four big buckets um, of, of technology. At the bottom, you've got your kind of systems of record. You don't have many of them. You've got things like CRM, ERP, HR systems, things like that. Um, those power critical business functions. You don't have many of those systems. They don't evolve very often. Above that, um, jumping right up to the top, and then I'll, I'll, I'll work my way down again. Um, so at the other end of the scale, you've got systems of engagement. So these are the systems that companies use to talk to their customers. Um, uh, so you know, ad tech, support desk software, marketing automation. It's a huge, huge, crowded, hectic, crazy space. Um, lots of different vendors in there, and I've got some examples up there. Then um, the reason kind of we're all here is this idea of systems of intelligence. Um, so AI, machine learning platforms. Um, but actually, systems of intelligence have been around for decades. Um, so um, Yeli and I started Snowplow having done a lot of work with the web analytics packages that were very common and popular um, 10 years ago and actually still are very popular, things like Google Analytics. Um, so there's a form of intelligence system for a specific audience. Um, then the other category that's, that sort of explains Snowplow is this idea of systems of observation. So these are the systems that are giving you the, the, the signals, the, the data, the, the source data that is powering your systems of intelligence. So you know, event data pipelines like ourselves, um, uh, people like um, Stitch and Xplenty who are pulling data out of your SaaS systems and your databases. Um, and then IoT has, has got huge. So think of all those systems out there now that are collecting sensor data from uh, vehicles, from uh, factories and things like that. So this is kind of how we think of the, the landscape, um, and, and that's quite important as I, as I sort of talk about what makes an effective data team. 
The other thing that's really important is how we think about data maturity. Um, so we kind of break it into maybe four rough phases. So um, very kind of early before, before being ready for any of this stuff that we're going to talk about today. That's, we call that pre-data maturity. Then you've got early stage data maturity. Um, this is where you maybe hire your first data MacGyver. So I love that expression. I, I heard it from someone the other day, this, this, kind of, this idea of you know, a single person who's a sort of huge fixer. They roll their sleeves up. They start building stuff, um, getting some initial value out of a company's data. Assuming the, the, the MacGyver um, does, does his or her job, um, then you'll start to build a data team. So you'll start to sort of build a, a capability in your company. Maybe that's a dedicated team. Maybe it's inside of engineering or it's inside of the old business intelligence function, but it's starting to kind of coalesce. And you're probably starting to wonder how you, how you hire your first data scientist, for example. Um, kind of going further forwards, data is starting to prove its strategic value. There are some wins around data, like the data team is actually kind of managing to do some stuff that's getting noticed at the, the, the high level of the company. Um, and then you're probably at some point getting some sort of chief data officer or similar in. Um, and that's, that's when you're really at a kind of a quite sophisticated level and, and investing in this very seriously. So um, that's, that's kind of an original that's, that's our framing. That's how we see the, the world and how we think about data teams within it. Um, thinking about, um, thinking about uh, the data team, I wanted to come up with some sort of way of, um, some sort of, way of breaking down what a data team needs to do, um, how they want to achieve things. And so I kind of came up with a bit of a hierarchy of needs, a little bit like Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and then uh, I got some feedback on the deck that it needed more random forest in it. So uh, I, added, I added that slide. Oh, let's go back. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs, applying this to the data team, I think all of you will be really familiar with um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it starts at the bottom with kind of safety, physiological safety. For us in the world of data, that is, data is available. That is like the most basic thing. If data is not available, we can't do our job. Um, getting to the level above that, actually, sorry, the, the level above that is safety and security. The data needs to be high quality. We, we, it needs to be safe to use. Um, and that was going to be the original topic of my talk. But as I worked on that, I realized there was a kind of a broader remit here, and I wanted to cover off the whole, the whole triangle, if you will. I think above that, love and belonging, um, the company, the wider company, is structured for data success. Self-esteem. Leadership believes it's running a data company. It's not just saying it's running a data company, it actually is, and, and, it, and it's changing. Um, and then hopefully with all that, you get into self-actualization. Um, and self-actualization, I think, here would be data scientists in that company are doing industry-leading work. That data team is, is seen as best in market. So let's take the first um, tier of that, data is available. So data is available sounds really obvious. But actually, if it's not true, then you're not going to be doing much data science. Um, it's, data collection is the foundation of the data value chain. Um, if you don't have that data, then fundamentally, you're a brain in a jar. Like you don't have um, the nervous system that's providing all those signals. And collecting data is super hard. So you know, you've got multiple sources of data coming from all sorts of different systems. Those systems are unreliable. They're constantly changing. They're breaking the data contracts. It's not an easy problem. Um, fundamentally, there are two different types of data that data companies are looking to collect. Um, there's real-time event data. So this is the stuff coming out of your websites, your mobile apps, um, your email systems, things like that. Um, but then you've also got these really big, important pots of slowly evolving data. For example, the stuff that's sitting in those systems of record I, I mentioned earlier. Um, and so with, between all of that, um, you've got a ton of data you need to collect. However, the good news here is that Data collection is pretty much a solved problem in 2019. So there's a wide variety of commercial and open source systems, systems of observation, to use my earlier language, that exist and can capture that real-time event data, um, all that slowly evolving data. And another really important thing is that you don't have to capture all the things. So inside any company, there is a lot of duplicated signal. There are a lot of things that look like really important um, uh, events or, or, or behavioral signals, but actually they're just echoes, uh, mirrors, reflections of, of the core um, behaviors that are happening inside that company or with that company's customers. So you, you just really need to track down the original signal. 
this, the first part of the solved problem is just collecting your real-time event data from websites, mobile apps, and all that sort of stuff. There's a bunch of SaaS companies out there called tag managers, customer data platforms, people like Segment and Particle Telium, um, and they, they, they make it fairly convenient to do that. Um, if you're at a kind of a slightly lower on the data maturity, um, then those guys um, work really well. Um, Snowplow um, up as a kind of a real-time event data pipeline. Uh, we help you do that as well, so we're available open source. You can run in your own cloud, and, and we have we have focuses on things like data quality that that speak more to the the higher the higher part of the um, the data team's hierarchy of needs. Um, but fundamentally, what I want you to take away from this is it's it's pretty much the solved problem here. Oh. The second solved problem is collecting your slowly evolving data from operational databases, SaaS platforms, things like that. Um, there's loads of tools that do that, Aluma, Stitch, XMNT, tons of them. Um, they all have slightly different names, they all have slightly different specializations. Um, the key thing is that those guys all um, have lots of customers and they have lots of sources and they maintain those sources so that any individual company doesn't have to build all this stuff themselves. And that is a warning, that is a warning I, I would give you. Um, sometimes data engineers like to break out the old toolbox and build this stuff from scratch. Uh, and there's a lot of reasons they'll come up with to do that. The pre-built solution is too expensive. I can build this in a week. The pre-built solution doesn't understand the specifics of our business. Our business is not like any other business. Um, if we use a pre-built solution, we'll be locked into that vendor, as opposed to being locked into the, the data engineer who built the, built the proprietary thing. So I do recommend trying to dissuade your data engineers from, from spending their time on this, because you need to keep your data engineers fresh for the much harder problems that are coming up next in this presentation. Um, and that is the, the first problem I want to talk around here is, is data is high quality. Oh. So data quality is just a very tough problem, and it's a very tough problem throughout the whole data lifecycle. You're going to be leaning very heavily on your data engineers to help you, to help you with this. Um, so when we think about the data lifecycle at Snowplow, we think about creating, collecting that data. We think about storing that data. We think about socializing it, activating it, and then in, this, uh, in the new world, which is much more much more privacy conscious than it was maybe five, 10 years ago. We're also looking at expiry, deletion, control of access, things like that. So that whole life cycle is not easy. Um, and it's, um, it's really important to work with your data engineers on that. Um, the problems are broader than just completeness and cleanliness. Um, so there's a few different problems I want to call out. Making sure the data is complete and correct. Data that isn't complete and correct destroys confidence faster than, than anything else. Um, you know, a, an output, a set of reports where the numbers don't match up to uh, someone else's numbers, that just is confidence destroying. So you need to really identify a report, recover data which doesn't comply to schema. You need to report on anomalies in the data to spot that things are going wrong as, 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 you, as you work. And you really need a, a, a single source of truth for, for all this data. You need to believe that, or you need to create a company where um, essentially everyone is working off the same data. It's not, it's not um, different siloed data pods. Um, making sure the data is semantically understood is really important as well. So um, it's really important to, it's sometimes called a unified semantic layer, but fundamentally what we're talking about here is some place for data meaning to live, some place for people to understand what data is available, where to get it, um, but also to understand the lineage. So what assumptions have gone into processing that data, modeling that data? Um, that's really, really important. And, and it's so easy for things to break down at this point um, because fundamentally it becomes a communication problem. Um, these days as well, compliance is really, really important. So, you know, um, companies are seeing data as increasingly a strategic asset, but it's also becoming a strategic liability. Um, so you've got to be thinking about, you know, are you using the data in a way that's consistent with the basis on which that data was collected from, for example, end users? That's pretty, that, that's some pretty gnarly stuff right there. Um, in a world of GDPR, we're seeing that like data subjects um, what, they, what they want is evolving, and like, the expectation of, on which they've shared that data is, is changing. Um, so there's a lot of thought that needs to go into that. Um, and equally, uh, you need, it's not enough to just put these processes in place. You need to actually be able to demonstrate that you're compliant with these kinds of processes. So all of this kind of really brings us towards this idea that actually we've got to build a common language between the data team and the rest of the organization. 
And that brings me on to the next kind of level in the hierarchy, which is that the company itself needs to be structured for data success. And this is a really, really tough problem. Um, when I speak to heads of data and chief data officers and people like that, this is one of the biggest problems they are grappling with. And so I'll probably spend a bit more time um, talking this through. So at the middle of the slide, we've got the data team working on insights, working on data science, trying to, to, to get a handle on the data, understand what's going on, um, build and test models, and then make sure that that work has an impact on the wider business. Um, but making sure that that work has that impact is, the, it is super tough. Um, so one of the things I call out is operationalizing the work. So moving out of the lab environment, getting results in actual operational systems, dealing with differences in data sources, dealing with differences in data processing, modeling, feature engineering, things like that, handling conflicts with existing operational rule sets. So this is, um, this is something I talked about a little bit earlier in the lightning talk, um, where I was um, digging into how we, we move machine learning into a real-time environment. That's a really tough problem. It's really easy to end up in a kind of a, a forked environment where you've got these kind of offline insights that you're coming up with in, in the you know, metaphorical lab, and it's really hard to move those into, um, into actual operational um, systems. I think there's also a challenge around selling the work to other teams. Um, so uh, it's the example of the control freak CEO who understands that uh, understands that machine learning is happening, understands that there's algorithms at play, but, but fundamentally, emotion, almost emotionally, can't quite get it or isn't comfortable with it. Um, you know, uh, someone gave me the example from an uh, online retailer the other day where um, the CEO understands that you know, um, personalization is happening, recommendation is happening, um, but he'd, he'd, he'd gone and looked at swimwear on the site, and then he was getting a lot of swimwear ads, and he couldn't understand why. And, 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 and so the team had to talk him through it, um, but he just couldn't almost get comfortable with it, um, even though he should have been able to understand the, the, the logic behind it. So I think there's a wider, a wider point here, which is that you've got to be able to convince other teams that the outcomes of data science will make their lives easier. It's not just um, an integration chore. It's not something they have to kind of file in the too difficult bucket. They need to understand um, that it's a it's a, it's a reciprocal relationship. And I think there's another piece here, which is understanding, um, figuring out how to, how to communicate with other teams whose, whose own work is going to change, so whose own tasks are going to evolve. Um, you know, as automated decisioning comes in, perhaps they're going to do less of the grunt work, perhaps they're going to do less repetitive tasks, and they're going to have uh, more, more opportunity for creativity um, on the piece that hasn't been um, automated away. But, but the, Working through that with that team is, is, is never going to be easy. That's fundamentally a people, a people problem, a cultural problem, not a, not a technology one. And then I think there's a piece around um, learning to let go. So this is, a, this is an interesting theme that comes up, which is you build, you build this algorithm, you build this model, um, you run it for a while, but then actually for it really to stick, for it really to have a long-term positive impact on the business, you've kind of got to let it go. You've got to transfer it to another team, perhaps. Um, and, that, and, and with that comes understanding that business users themselves have insights, they have enhancements that they can make to your work and they want to run with that and they want to bring their domain knowledge um, to bear on, on, on what you've built. Um, that's, you know, letting go is never easy. Um, I think the, the, the last piece there is, is, is one I've sort of alluded to but it's important to call out and it's this idea of dependencies on other teams. So you know, as you move out of that MacGyver mode, um, you're, you're moving into a world where you're in a team, you're working with other teams, and suddenly you have to rely on these other teams to get things done where before um, you could just do it yourself. You'd just you know, um, fire up your editor and maybe add some event tracking to the website or the mobile app, and suddenly you know, you're going through processes and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, and figuring out how you're going to map onto those other teams, understand how they work is, is, uh, is a challenge. Um, one tool I find quite helpful for dealing with that kind of challenge um, is, is thinking about culture and thinking about how culture works in different teams and different organizations. So um, I really like that analogy of a, a company starting with a data MacGyver and then migrating to a data A team. That's, that's actually quite similar to, um, to uh, the thinking of a guy called Simon Wardley. Um, and he has this idea that when you're building um, Products, any product could be a data product, could be um, a software product, could be a physical product. Um, 
you go through different phases um, that require different cultures from the people working on those phases. And that's a really important part. So um, the way he looks at it is you've got your pioneers. Um, they're the people who are, they're the MacGyvers. They're the people who go out there, um, uh, tackle, tackle difficult, risky situations, work through them, solve things themselves. Um, they'll typically hand, hand over to the settlers, which would be the A-team in the, in the old analogy. Um, and they're much better at kind of starting to um, understand how processes would come in place, understand how structures would come in place, understand how to scale this thing. Um, and then after that, you get to the town planners who are much more about a kind of a steady state, mature system that just um, is going to just keep working like that. And the key point here is you need different structures at different times um, and you need to stay flexible. So, you know, if the interface between your data team or multiple data teams, um, if that's starting to break down with the wider company, if, if you know, um, th trouble is brewing, then, then change it up, change it up, bring in, um, uh, bring in different personality types that can that can work on these on these problems. Um, so this is an interesting one. Leadership believes it is running a data company. Uh, so this I had a bit of fun writing this one. So it's important to think back to what's happening in the wider market. Advances in data are transforming the way companies do business. The world is changing. Digital platforms make it much, much easier to collect way more data than we've ever collected before. Um, it's letting companies interact with individual consumers in a way more personalized experience. Obviously, there's some massive downsides and ethical concerns here, as well as um, positive benefits for business. Um, changes in AI, machine learning, all of these advances in analytic technology, it's just night and day relative to the kind of packaged insights and analytics we were doing 10, 15 years ago. Um, and real time has been a huge, uh, a huge disruptor. This idea that we're moving from a world where you know every morning you have um, you have your data crunched from yesterday to this is happening in a few seconds is is an incredible um, enabler of change. So all of this, when you put it together, is creating opportunities for business. Um, data enabled companies can compete in a very aggressive way. Um, companies that are using data as, as a strategic asset. They're very well placed to understand what's happening in their market. They're very well placed to understand how to improve. Um, and yet that creates challenges as well. So um, executing on these data opportunities is very, very hard. Um, it requires a lot of technology understanding. It requires a lot of strategic and operational change, um, like I discussed in the last few slides. Um, it, there's a lot of people problems involved. There's a lot of tech problems involved. And then you bring into bear that in each of these industries, these new tech and data enabled competitors are becoming a real threat. So, you know, five, 10 years ago, a few industries were incredibly tech driven and a few industries were starting to get tech competitors. But now every industry has got its Airbnb in the way that, you know, the hotel industry has Airbnb. Every industry has their Airbnb now. And that's incredibly scary. It's very, very scary for companies. Um, and that's just on the, the, the asset side. Um, the, the strategic liability around things like GDPR, e-privacy, things like that, that's massive. Like that's, you know, we're not in a world now where you can just tinker and explore um, and see what you can get out of data. You have to be really mindful of where that data has come from and what, um, what commitments you made in collecting that data. So the whole, the whole space is getting much tougher. Um, and companies are adapting to deal with that. So um, some of them are hiring chief data officers. Um, some of them are... Um, putting in place these awesome new data teams, and I'm sure many of you in the audience are in those data teams already, um, thinking about uh, all of these problems and all of the problems that are discussed in, in this talk. Um, so the key point here is that the world is changing really fast. But then we don't know, when we look at an individual company, is the leadership really betting on data? Is it really doubling down on data as a strategic force, or is it just kind of playing big, big data bingo, you know, with all the, uh, all the buzzwords that we, we know and love? Um, so a few kind of crude heuristics for me, um, which I think can help to, to, to identify how, how seriously this is being taken by a company. Um, so the first is investment. Like investment is hard to fake. Um, is the company investing in growing its team and technology around data? Um, is the company investing in training and upskilling the existing data team members? That's an incredibly valuable thing to do. Those, those people that are already inside your company and understand data, um, they've got that domain knowledge. They can, um, they can learn a lot of, a lot of these data skills. Um, are they committing to change? So is data science quarantined in some sort of innovation lab, 
or is it disruptively central? Is it really, really core to the business? Um, if you've got this kind of head of data or CDO, um, how many hops are there from that person up to the CEO to the board? Like, are data questions really being treated at the highest levels of this company? Is the company publicizing concrete wins? Um, you know, is it just talking generally about, well, we're a data company now, or is it actually calling out specific victories that were driven by the data team? Is it saying, you know, we were in this market, we crunched the numbers, we ran the models, and we realized that we, sh we, we shouldn't be in that market, and we've pulled out? Or um, we, had a, we were sitting on a ton of data around this performance thing, we created a data product about that, we've gone out and sold that to um, a bunch of interested parties. So these are the sorts of tangible things that go beyond just um, PR buzz. And then I think the last one, which is really, really crucial, is around the ethical side of things. So, you know, we've had some talks today about, and, and through the week, I think, around ethics, around the, the moral dimension of this corporate social responsibility. Is the leadership team seriously grappling with that ethical dimension? Um, you know, what is your, what are the, what are the likely impacts, second order, third order impacts of the work you're doing, um, the, the, the data products that you're creating? Um, is that really being engaged with? And I think the recent, I think it was last week, the implosion of uh, Google's AI ethics board is a, is a good cautionary tale there. You know, it was, um, it was fundamentally created as, as it seems to be more of a PR-led approach rather than fundamentally um, creating decision-making power around um, AI and, and the ethical side of that. So you know, are these things really being engaged with? So that kind of brings us up to the, 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 the top part of the, the stack. Data scientists are doing industry-leading work. And my argument here is that if the, all the lower floors are in place, if all those other parts of the, the hierarchy of needs are in, in place, hopefully you're now em empowered to do industry-leading, market-beating work. What does that environment look like? I think, I think you all know what that environment looks like. I've got a few suggestions, but, but I think intrinsically you guys know, intuitively you know if you're in that environment. I think there's something around publishing, writing, and training. So that could be publishing in data science journals if you're doing, for example, machine learning research. It could just be technical blog posts, tutorials, technical reports that are going out to you know, um, uh, the industry, the market, um, uh, your peers. Um, then I think there's also something very important about internal education. So you know, are you working to educate the wider company on what the data team is doing um, and, and how they can help to make sure everything really comes together. Uh, the middle one, I mean, I, 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 I provisoed at the start of my talk that I was going to be focused on, on, on commercial companies and, and, and the data capabilities inside those. Um, a lot of it comes down to beating the competition. Like That's why boards are investing in these kinds of data capabilities at this point. Um, you know, is your work gaining significant competitive advantage in the market? Is it winning industry awards for innovative or breakthrough use of data? My argument is if you've got those lower tiers in place, you will be, you will be doing that. Um, interestingly, there's a real tension here with the, the publishing, the, the kind of the, the market education piece, which is you know, suddenly the company starts seeing your work as secret source, as the thing that is its competitive edge, and that's, a, that's always going to be a bit of an interesting tension. And then finally, I'd, I'd call out investing and scaling. So, you know, um, are you investing in growing the team? Um, are you investing in the best tools, the best processes, the best um, training materials to support that team? Um, and is the company investing in you? Is it making sure that your personal development keeps you at the company and keeps that company ma maintaining its data edge? Um, because that data edge is, is just so crucial these days. So that um, kind of brings me up to my conclusion. Um, I hope the talk was interesting. Apologies for the U-turn in the topic. I sort of widened out that, that topic at the, at the last minute. Um, I love talking to data scientists. I love talking to everyone in the data team. Um, and we'd love to have kind of conversations with you guys off, after this. Um, huge thanks to the Data Science Festival for, um, for, for having us at, at, from Snowplow here. Um, and we've probably got a, a good chunk of time for questions, Rob. Oh, amazing. Any questions? Any questions? Oh, uh, sorry, you first and then you go for it, yeah. Um, hi, so I just wanted to go back to um, one of the points you were making about 
making the company sort of um, a sort of um, data um, structured. Um, when you have the data team as sort of a separate part of the organization, it's not like a core in the middle, how do you sort of transition that to try and make them more central and make people understand that that should be the sort of core of their knowledge without sort of enforcing it on them and saying you have to do this? I think that's a, that's a really, really good question. So um, it's, it's a tough one. So we definitely, um, d first things first, we definitely see that companies are building that, that, that centralized data team a lot. So, you know, um, over, over the years, things often flip-flop between embedding kind of data capability in lots of other teams. So, you know, having data experts inside marketing or having them inside ops um, versus kind of centralization. And we see that centralization is happening at the moment. Um, and in the same way that probably about 10, 10 to 20 years ago, there was centralization with a BI team. So there was a BI team that reports up to the CFO, and now there's a centralization again. I think that centralization is important because of that unification point. So it's the idea that you've got to have one team that's worrying about you know, getting that single view of all the signals that, that matter that, to that business. Then the, the challenge becomes exactly what you said. How does that, how does that team kind of build, build linkages out to the rest of the organization. The rest of the organization understands that they can go to that team and work really closely with that team to get what they need. Um, so I think marketing is a really good example of another team because marketing is, is on a real push over the last few years to become way more data centric. Um, so how does, a, how does a marketing team that's desperately trying to get more data savvy, how's that, how, how do they work with the data team that's sort of building that and understanding that? I think there's a few tricks. I think that um, embedding is one of the best things you can do. So you take that data team and you just do rotations. You do embeds into the other team and you bring those, those other teams into the data team as well. Obviously, you're going to have challenges there, a bit with like common language and skill sets and things. Um, but I think that's one of the best techniques. And we, we use that in, in Snowplow and other parts of the business. And we use it with our data capability as well. So our people who spend time working on our company data go out to other teams and work with them and train up those other teams on working with data. But it's not an easy, it's not an easy problem. Um, it's a really good question. Hi, uh, great talk. Oh, um, the other parallel to your sort of MacGyver to A team <laughs> is the sort of product development life cycle, mm, yeah. early adopters and, and traditionally you get very, it's not just culture, it's people's pre uh, perception of, of where they want to be. Yeah. So in, in your experience, do the MacGyvers tend to stay on or are they very interested in sort of moving off at a particular stage? And how do you get handover at those different stages of, of kind of cultural outlook, for want of a better word? That's a really good question. So um, a lot of MacGyvers end up moving on. So um, I, I see it with software engineering as well, which is where I spend a lot of time. But a lot of MacGyvers end up moving on because um, companies don't get that they need to support multiple different cultures and attitudes for success. And so what often happens is, um, you know, success breeds a bigger company, a bigger team, more processes. And so people think that the whole company, let alone the data team, but the whole company, but including the data team, need to move on that track. And actually, if you can find ways to keep the MacGyvers happy and engaged and, and make sure they still have the agency, um, and that's tough, right? Because you're, you, they're still having to follow a lot more process and deal with these other big teams now. Um, but if you can find a way of keeping them and keeping them motivated, you're in a much more powerful space because you can be sure that there's some you know, younger, hungrier competitor that only has MacGyvers. And, and, and when your MacGyvers leave, that's where they're going to go. And suddenly you've got a, a very powerful, well-armed data competitor. Great question. Any other questions? Colm. <laughs> um, yeah, just, uh, just interested in the problem you spoke about of communicating to a C CEO who just didn't understand the product. Um, do you think the solution to that is in what you communicate, how you communicate, or, or just simplifying what you're doing? That's a really, that's a good question. How do you communicate to that? Um, that's like the old school CEO. So I was, I was chatting to a, a, a guy, uh, uh, I was chatting to Bertel outside and he was telling me how in a lot of, um, I think in Facebook, like all the, all the staff are kind of auto excluded from the AB tests and in a lot of game studios, like the spouse of the CEO will be like excluded from all the personalization stuff. So there's just, 
there's a lot of kind of drastic measures being taken to try and avoid this problem and make sure that um, difficult conversations aren't being had with, with people who are maybe very senior but not, um, not fully, um, fully on board and understanding the, the tech. I think, I think it has to be, I think that's a bit drastic. I think it has to be an education process. Um, and I think it, it has to come from both sides. I think the data team has to want to explain this stuff and communicate it and really um, translate it, if you will, for, for, the, for the business. Um, and I think equally the, the business and um, the CEO, they have to want to learn this stuff. They have to want to believe that this is going to change their business and, and that it's going to change their, their careers and, and, and what they get out of the company. Great question. Any other? Hi, I'm around the corner. Sorry. Oh, sorry, yeah. <laughs> Behind the pillar. Uh, your last point there on um, fitting into the agile scrum um, sort of workflow. Have you got any uh, extra perspectives on that for sort of data people trying to work in that kind of quicker turnaround where maybe the projects would naturally be longer in the data science? Yeah, it's a it's a good question. It's a hard it's a hard problem. So we um, at Snowplow we see it quite a lot around. Um, uh, uh, tracker instrumentation. So what I mean is um, when the data team is working with, for example, the mobile program, uh, mobile developers to get um, tracking into the apps to, to emit all the different, um, you know, important signals that are coming out of the app. And culturally, it's just quite tough sometimes because um, the, uh, the mobile uh, dev team are on a tough cycle. They're trying to get this thing out before some sort of event. Um, they are really focused on their convenience, what's, what's easiest for them. And, and the cost of doing that poorly or, or not fully understanding the data requirements, it's not really borne by them. It's borne by the data team and the data engineers who are trying to clean it up and the data scientists who are trying to make sense of this not, not well cleaned, uh, corrupted data. And so again, it becomes a kind of a, a cultural thing or a communication thing. But like, it's important for the data team working, for example, with those developers to really um, get them to understand the pain and that you know, it, it, it does make a difference going a little bit slower, being a little bit clearer with the data schemas and structures and stuff. It has a huge impact on the data team. The data team might have you know, 10, 30, 40 people who will all be dealing with that crappy data if they don't fix it. One, one trick I've, I've heard that does work quite well is, is getting that return loop going, that return path. So, um, you, you say to the, the mobile uh, developers, for example, this isn't just going into a black box. We're making decisions out of this data, and that's going to drive, um, maybe offline, it's going to drive your product roadmap, so it's going to drive what you build next. Or maybe, even more excitingly, it's going to literally drive you know, features and um, active personalization or flagging of things on or off in the actual app. So if you can get that kind of return loop going, um, that's that's sort of the holy grail because then they will they'll literally get why they're doing what they're doing. That's a great question. Cool. Maybe that's a wrap. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. Thanks, guys. <laughs>